dear friends and colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you again to this webinar, and it's an honor to be the first speaker talking about generalities or principles in reconstructive microsurgery. It's already 60 years uh, when the first free flap was described, and in contrast to other reconstructive techniques, reconstructive microsurgery has evolved significantly in the past 20 years. If you open every month a um, journal of plastic surgery, you find there is an increasing use and new applications of these techniques. Um, the classical reconstructive ladder um, used to say that free flap was considered like the last resource, but with the modern reconstructive elevator, this has changed and free flaps can be the first choice. Current philosophy indeed says that reconstruct the defect with the best possible method on the primary basis in order to provide the patient with the best functional and aesthetic result. But doing a free flap is not only about connecting small vessels and uh, making sure that your flap is gonna survive. Cutting edge reconstructive microsurgery demand us to provide patients with safe and reliable free flaps and um, to provide customized flaps with minimal donor side morbidity and ideally in one stage. The reason why back surgery is so well accepted in all the world is because the success rate is really very high. Nevertheless, we have to deal always with a re-exploration rate of around 4%. Of course, it is not the same if we compare a trauma reconstruction with cancer reconstruction in terms of the incidence of thrombosis and failure. And I think the biggest, the biggest challenge in reconstructive microsurgery is still replantation, where the incidence of this complication is still uh, higher. Losing a free flap is something we all have to, 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 to uh, face from time to time. Um, and of course, this can um, be very, very emotional for any surgeon, not to mention for the patient and the family. And we have to make a very critical analysis of what was the mistake, and of course, to plan a new operative technique. But instead of talking about um, complication, I think uh, we have to analyze how to be successful with doing uh, free flaps. And like in any other my, my surgical technique, I think there is a learning curve that we all need to go through, starting from being a resident and then uh, develop, developing your own practice. Uh, it's not only about doing free flaps, you also have to learn other, other issues about how a free flap regenerates, uh, what is bus spasm, thrombosis and its pharmacological management, uh, ischemia reperfusion injury and how to manipulate it, and also how to establish a post-op monitoring, monitoring protocol in order to recognize and to learn how to solve a flap failure. For preparative planning, I think it's very important to have a good clinical judge. And um, this can be summarized in, by following the four P's that I'm gonna mention. Number one is an adequate patient selection. Number two is to assess correctly the problem to see, to know what is gonna be removed and then you can determine what tissues you need for reconstruction to do a meticulous pre-op, trans-op, and post-op planning of your surgery. And finally, to define priorities of your reconstruction. There are some controversial indications for a free flap. Some of these have been discussed in the past 20, 30 years. And uh, for instance, pediatric age used to be um, a little uh, controversial. But nowadays we know that um, uh, children are, are really very healthy in terms of the tissue, the vessels. And the only difference is that probably we're working with smaller uh, structures, but I mean, you can consider that you're gonna use perhaps um, more refined techniques for the dissection and everything like that. Elderly patients, the same, they are not a contraindication anymore. But the problem with elderly patients is that many times they have associated morbidities so that increases the incidence of complications. So uh, in, in order to be able to do a free flap, uh, first you have to control the um, uh, diabetes, hypertension, or, or any cardiac, pulmonary, or renal disease, for instance. High VMI is not a contraindication for a free flap, but we know it's associated with a higher incidence of um, flap necrosis, partial flap necrosis. Um, the same happens with tobacco use, 
it's not it's, it's not going to affect the patency of your microvascular anastomosis, but there is a higher incidence of um, wound adhesions and necrosis uh, in the donor side and sometimes in the in the recipient. And peripheral vascular disease perhaps is the only contraindication because definitely there is a lineal association between higher morbidity and this um, um, problem. And um, in when you when you see a patient with this disease. Uh, definitely, you ask. You need to ask for imaging studies to assess the microvascular anatomy of your flap, and also to uh, select the correct recipient vessels. When is the best time to do a free flap? Um, I think we all agree that in cancer patients, it is ideal to do it immediately, uh, following Marco Godina's principles. Um, in patients with lower limb severe trauma. Uh, it is ideal to do an emergency flap in the first 72 hours to have a better functional outcome and a faster recovery. It can be a relative emergency in replantation, uh, but I think it's better to have everything set up uh, prior to going to the OR. Otherwise, if you don't have everything ready, then you can really uh, have struggle and lose your replantation. For the surgical plan, I think you need to follow these four points to design the flap, to consider always a V plan if there is a failure, to determine which is gonna be the patient position during surgery, and to organize all your surgical team and to assign a role to each participant. Just a few words about the recipient vessels. It is better to select these ones uh, outside the area with trauma or with radiation therapy damage. In selecting the ideal free flap, you have to determine what is required versus what is available. And of course, to follow the principle to try to replace like with like tissue. It's important to assess also the vascular pedicle and to be familiar with all different flaps. Um, for, for instance, this is um, an example of the four uh, free flaps that we have available for mandible reconstructions. They were drawn on a scale one to one. So you can see the quantity and quality of bones of tissue and skin paddle that you can harvest from each flap. Again, the pedicle length. And to consider some uh, functional issues that are important, like for instance, which flaps are, have the potential for insertion of osteointegrated dental implants. Um, this is my mentor, Fu Chen Wei, 25 years ago. Uh, and I learned from him and many other master microsurgeons that it's really, really crucial that you have a delicate management of your tissues and vessels. Uh, and to have greater, greater precision with small vessels. Uh, use magnifying loops, not only for dissecting your, your flaps, you can use them also if you don't have a microscope to do the anastomosis. And uh, remember that it's important that not because you're doing microsurgery, you're gonna do micro incisions. Try always to have an adequate access and exposure. If you see it, you can do it. And it's better to operate on a plate and not in, on a bottleneck. Another golden rule in reconstructive microsurgery is to work on the bloodless field. And for that, you can use monopolar or bipolar electrocautery. And there are um, different size hemoclips. Blood is opaque. And you cannot repair a watch in the knee well. During the execution stage, I think it's important not to hurry. Make every move count. and it's remember that speed ultimately will follow experience and success is the sum of all efforts repeated day in and day out. Uh, remember to irrigate the tissues, um, a cell that dries, a cell that dies. During work, when, while working under the microscope, it is really very important that you have a comfortable position. I know very many, several colleagues who already underwent cervical spine surgery. Um, and it's important also that you try to work on a pleasant and comfortable uh, environment. Battling is synonymous with failure. And of course, you have to know all the instruments in the microscope that you're gonna use. These are the irrigation solutions that we use. The Eparin, uh, we use a um, dilution of 10,000 units in 200 cc, 250 cc, of solu physiologic solution. And our um, vasodilators that we use is hylocaine and sometimes papaverine. 
Uh, there are many microvascular sutures that are manufactured in different sizes depending on the diameter of, of the thread and the needle. This can go from 8-0 to 12-0. I think the one that we use more, more often is a 9-0, uh, which is because we, most of the vessels are two to three millimeter diameter. Uh, and these are also useful for nerve repair. The smaller sutures are used for um, vessels that are 0 0.8 to 2 millimeters, also for smaller nerves like the digital ones. But also here you can see that some sutures are also uh, used for lymphatics. 11O is used for smaller than one millimeter vessels and for also smaller lymphatics and fascicular neurography. In the, in the recent years, a couple of new sutures were introduced, 12O and 13O. In this picture, you can see the difference in the size between a 12O compared with a 9O and with a normal hair. And here, it's a 13O suture. Uh, you can see that it's really difficult to see on naked eye. And compared with a hair, it's really nothing. You have to manipulate it under the microscope. And these two sutures were introduced by our respected and good friend, Professor Isao Koshima, uh, who introduced the com concept of super microsurgery. Uh, in general terms, that is used for any microvascular anastomosis that is less than 0 0.8 millimeters. Here is Isao when he visited us for the first time back in 2010 in Mexico City. To be able to do supermarket surgery, you also need to use special instruments that have been developed by these two companies. And there are multiple applications for supermarket surgical techniques, most of them described also by Professor Koshima. And I think um, uh, the, the list continues to evolve and it's increasing every, every year. But the main applications of supermarket surgery are perhaps for uh, LV anastomosis in patients with lymph, lymphedema where you can connect the, 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 vein, the, the lymphatic vessel with a vein through a small skin incision or for fingertip replantation or more recently for something that was described by J.P. Hong, uh, the so-called perforator to perforator microvascular anastomosis to spare major vessels when you are doing a free flap for lower extremity, for instance. We can use another anastomotic devices. I think the venous coupler is very popular, especially for the vein. The problem with the venous coupler is that you cannot use it for uh, less than one millimeter veins. And these other kind of devices that are still under um, research without any clinical applications yet. Microvascular anastomosis can be done end to end or end to side. The, um, I think the, mode, the, the indications for end to side are first of all, um, size discrepancy between the two vessels. But the most important one is when you really need to preserve a uh, distal flow in one leaf and you don't want to sacrifice um, uh, one of the major vessels. You can use interrupted, continuous, or intersusception techniques for doing the microvascular anastomosis. Of course, the one that we use and everybody knows better is the interrupted situ technique described by Alexis Carell in the beginning of last century, and the same principles still apply for end-to-end -end and for end-to-side microvascular anastomosis. Another technique is um, running or continuous um, microvascular suture. I use it in 95% of my patients, both for end-to-end -end and for end-to-side anastomosis. And uh, as I described a little bit more than 20 years ago, together with my other mentor, Peter Cordero from New York City, with this technique, with the continuous or running suture, uh, it, it is faster, uh, it is reliable because it has the same thrombosis rate that when using interrupted sutures. I think the biggest advantage is that it's useful for size discrepancy. It can be a little bit more hemostatic, and of course, it's less expensive. Some of the problems related with the pedicle that are a reason for uh, taking back a patient for a, due to a complication, is that the, the, the pedicle is twisted or it's kinked, that it can be sucked by the drain, sometimes because there is bleeding of side branches, or if the vein is compressed by the artery, artery, or sometimes if you need to tunnelize the pedicle, there is some swelling um, on, on, this, on the overlying tissue 
and this can also compress your pericle. After computing the microvascular anastomosis, it's important to fix the flap properly to prevent avulsion and to secure the pedicle position. Then check the pedicle length and the curves. And when closing the wound, try to avoid strain on the pedicle. And if there is some tension, it's better not to close and to use the screen, skin graft, like in this patient, uh, where you have to switch from the anterior tibial to the posterior tibial, recipient vessels in a, in a, in a foot reconstruction. I never use uh, sock drains unless I have a extensive dead space. I prefer to use capillary drains because I think there is, you, you don't have any less risk of having problems. For the post-op curves, it's important to avoid hypovolemia, hypotension and hypothermia, uh, to prevent a hematoma and an infection, to mobilize properly, to avoid pedicle movement. And again, it's very important to establish your own post-operative monitoring protocol. And something that is a little bit controversial is about if you need or not prophylactic anticoagulation. And the answer is no. There is no need to use any type of prophylactic um, medication. We only use the classical DVT guidelines to prevent any, any this problem, both trans and postoperatively. And after three days, we start giving the patient aspirin for the next three weeks. Monitoring a free flap is also very important. It's critical to success in microvascular surgery. Uh, because if you are able to recognize the, that there is a complication, you are able to treat it early. And actually, if you are able to solve this in the first six hours, there is a chance of 75% salvage rate. Rage. We know that venous problems are more often seen than arterial. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, um, if you have venous congestions, eventually you can have arterial insufficiency. So the ideal technique for free flaps monitor should be reliable, simple, accurate, non-invasive, and inexpensive. The available options can be divided into conventional and not conventional. And um, starting by observation, we need to look at the skin color, about, at the microcirculation, but please don't, don't start pricking or sticking or scratching your flaps. It's only necessary to do some gentle pressure to release and to see the capillary feel. Um, bleeding is um, important if, if, because it can be the first sign of venous thrombosis. Uh, Turgor is also useful to look at arterial failure. And finally, the temperature is also a good monitor, but watch out for heated flaps. These are the typical findings of a normal uh, venous congested and a, and a, and a, and a, and a patient or flap with arterial inflow problems. But monitoring is not always so easy. Sometimes there can be some color mismatch between the flap and the recipient area. And sometimes there can be some ecumatic areas that uh, the nurses or residents think that there is a venous congestion or some problem related with the vein. So whenever in doubt, it's good to do some uh, pinprick of the flap to observe the bleeding, if it's congestive or if there is no bleeding in case there is an arterial problem. And also it's difficult to, to, to monitor flaps that are in a, in, in a, in a difficult location, uh, for instance, intraorally or buried flaps. For uh, buried flaps, uh, actually, we always try to include an external sentinel segment for flap monitoring, like for this cervical esophagus reconstruction, where usually you remove this sentinel piece of bowel five days after surgery, or for a fibula free flap, you can include small skin island, or here for breast reconstruction, usually you remove or depictalize the skin islands one week after surgery if you want. And some flaps are difficult to monitor due to the, compos to the composition, uh, like a muscle flap. So in this kind of situation, I always try to incorporate a small skin island that is also useful as a monitor. Implantable Doppler is very, very reliable. Uh, the problem with uh, this kind of uh, device is that it can cause venous kinking. And again, as I mentioned before, it's difficult to use in small veins. A pulse oximetry is useful for monitoring um, finger replantations. But I think that the gold standard and what all of us uses 
daily in our practice is the handheld Doppler. Uh, the problem with this is that sometimes it's operator dependent and the, the Doppler signals uh, sometimes cannot be obtained in all flaps. Uh, new technologies incorporate uh, the use of ICG and different scanners to detect superficial vascular perfusion. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there are some drawbacks with these techniques. Uh, you can use laser Doppler, which is not available everywhere. And there are some other kind of uh, uh, monitoring devices that also are more expensive or not available in every country. This is the um, protocol that we follow in our hospital for the postoperative monitoring. We use mostly clinical assessment and ultrasound Doppler for the first 72 hours, every hour the first 24 hours, every two hours during the next 48 hours, and every three hours thereafter. Uh, pre prig uh, we only use it when there is a doubt. And again, you need to look at the uh, quality of the blood that is um, coming out. And implantable Doppler, we don't have it in our hospital. Uh, something that is also a little bit controversial is uh, if patients need to go to an ICU, if you need to work with a multidisciplinary team, and if you, you need, require some special technical support. And again, the answer is that there is no need for any of this, unless uh, the patient is under really a bad general condition or it was a long surgery uh, where you require this kind of support. To, to conclude, I would like to share with you uh, 10 recommendations that in my opinion have helped me a lot to try to be successful at an efficient microsurgeon. Number one, is to try to become a master. That means that you should focus doing mostly reconstructive microsurgery. You can, doesn't mean that you cannot do other kind of plastic surgery, but if you really wanna become a microsurgeon, you should do as much as you can uh, every year. Also remember that this is a teamwork, so try to delegate responsibilities. Try to use proper communication so everybody understand what you're talking about. Always carry out a very careful preparative planning and develop your own surgical routine and post-op care. Remember to give everything and everybody a proper place. Be competent and accurate during surgical performance. Always leave room for the unexpected and never forgot to try to improve your techniques and that also involves to never stop learning and always teach others, even from your mistakes. And the last but most important, the most important one, Please have fun. Thank you very much for your kind attention.